high school a few years ago. A few years ago. Yeah, wow. I and my brothers and sister always kind of had a little sense of dread when the phone would ring early in the morning. See, once my youngest brother got into school past kindergarten all day, my mom started doing some substitute work. And so, of course, as time went on, she got to get into more substitute work. She got this reputation where if the teacher wrote down the playbook, that's what she did. She didn't take any guff from the students. She was she was the mean sub. But she was really requested by the, the teachers because she did what they wanted to do. So any morning the phone rang and, and you heard, oh yeah, go into sub, you're thinking, oh boy, it's gonna be my school. Because let me tell you, I love my mom. I love my mom. I say that even then, I love my mom, but it's just not cool having your mom as teacher in math class. Or or it's a combined gym class, the boys and girls are out there together, and there's mom out there cracking the whip for gym class. Like, oh boy, <laughs> I'm not like the most athletic, and then here's her watching me. You know, she, she got into all kinds of crazy subjects because she just would do what the teacher wanted to do. She was a no-nonsense sub. One day, here we are, Spanish class, walk in, I knew it was coming, walk in on the board here, it says, Mrs. Winger. Now, sitting in this that I understand the school I went to, we had two middle schools, and then it funneled down to one high school. So some of the students you knew a long time, others were kind of new. Sitting in this class right in front of me was Laura, friend that had been in class for years, been in grades together for years and years, we went to the same middle school. Sitting behind me was literally my cousin. We were in the different middle schools, but we knew each other. Sitting right here was Sherry. I won't say her last name. I'm not sure I can remember it. Sherry did not go to the middle school I was in. I didn't know Sherry other than hi, she's Sherry in Spanish class. That was all that I knew Sherry. She didn't know me. Well, the class is getting started. We're working on some kind of assignment, and sure enough, Sherry decides, you know what? Sub, I want to get out of here for a little while. I can go. I'll go to the sub and see if I can go to the restroom. You know, you're not allowed to do that. Like, it wasn't in the rules. And I just kind of rolled my eyes here. This isn't going to work. She went up. She went up and asked if she could get a pass to go to the restroom. My mom, no, sorry. Uh, I really got it, but I, uh, uh, the rules are that and I have to follow the rules. You have to follow the rules. I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do. You're going to have to wait. You've had your opportunity. You're going to have to wait. So there was a little negotiation. You didn't get anywhere. It ended really quick. And then Sherry came back and sat down in her seat in a huff. <sighs> and then she started to unload. And it got rather colorful. Things I will not repeat here. She went into great vivid description of what she thought about this sub. My friend in front of me, Laura, and my cousin in the back of me, Ken, were just looking at them. Their jaws were on their desk. And I'm just going like, uh huh, uh huh, yeah, uh -huh. Mm -hmm. really? Oh, okay. And they're looking at me like, are you going to do anything? This is crazy. And so finally, Sherry starts looking at me and looking at them. And she looked at them and looked at them, and, looked at them and then she looked at the board, and you could just see, Oh my goodness! Oh, I'm so sorry! Oh, I'm so sorry! Oh! And she could do nothing but apologize for the rest of the class. And I think for the next about three or four days as well. She finally put together who I was and made that connection, realized who I was and who that sub was. And she was feeling, oh, let's just say, rather embarrassed at the least. This was a case where not recognizing someone, not recognizing me for who I was, brought her an awful lot of embarrassment. It's not always the case that it works that way, though. Often the tables get turned. Often the tables get turned, and it is the person who's not recognized who actually is the one who bears the embarrassments. Oftentimes this is the case. Let me give you an example. How many of you recognize the name Mahatma Gandhi? He was a tremendous figure in the 20th century in the world stage there. I think he was a Nobel Prize. He was hugely active in the effort to bring independence to India. He was a very, very, very strong adherent to his faith, the, the Hindu faith. He was asked at one point, uh, well, what do you think about Jesus? There were a lot of folks that were sympathetic to his cause and aligned with his cause, but they were of a different faith. And so the question was put to him, well, what do you think about Jesus? And his answer was, well, you know, I like your Jesus very much. I, I like your Jesus very much. But 
The trouble is that his followers often don't look very much like him. Today we live in a world that is predominantly Christian still. The, the predominant faith in the world today is Christianity. With about 7.5 billion people in the world, about 2.3 billion, almost a third of those people in the world are Christian. Incidentally, the next closest would be Muslim faith at about 1.8 billion, and then the Hindu faith about 1.1, then you have the Buddhists are about half a billion, and then all the rest of faiths combined account for about a little over half a billion. Now, there may be a lot of us out there. We may be literally everywhere. There are Christians in every country. In some countries, it's like, you know, three, but... There are Christians around the world, but for all of that, we are a very fractured bunch. If you think about that 2.3 billion, if you think about all those Christians around the world, everywhere that there is, over a billion of them are Roman Catholic. You put together the various branches of the Orthodox faith, Russian Orthodox, Serbian Orthodox, all those Orthodox branches, you put together those, you have several hundred million there. The Anglican Communion or Anglican faith brings in about 70 million Branches of the Lutheran Church total a little over 45 million. Branches of the Presbyterian Church total a little over 45 million. Methodists, or the Baptists rather, total a little over 35 million. And as Methodists together, if you combine us all together, there's about 30 million around the world. From there, the numbers drop dramatically. We go into hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of denominations and then countless countless independent churches. And so one might ask the question, when you think about Christians in the world today, who are we? There's a whole lot of us out there, but who are we? You think the Christians and Christianity might have a little bit of an identity crisis? I do. Let me read a passage for you from the Gospel of John. I think many of you will recognize this passage from John's Gospel. If you want to follow along in your own Bible or write this down, this is John chapter 17. I'm going to be reading verses 20 to 23. John 17, 20 to 23. This is Jesus praying, praying in the garden before his arrest. My prayer is not for them alone. He's talking about the disciples there. I pray also for those who will believe in me through their message, that all of them may be one. Father, just as you are in me and I am in you. May they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I have given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I in them, and you in me. May they be brought to complete unity, to let the world know that you have sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. <clears throat> Father, I want those you have given me to be with me where I am, and to see my glory, the glory you have given me, because you love me before the creation of the world. You read this, you read Jesus in the garden, his prayer for those who would come to believe, literally his prayer for you and me, and for generations before us, for our parents and our grandparents and our great-grandparents. You read his prayer for all those generations from his day until this day, and what is it that you see he is praying for? He is praying for this idea of unity. But we seem to be awfully far removed from that idea that he prayed for, do we not? There may be a whole lot of us out there, but how united are we? Now, I'm not even talking about the United Methodist Church. How united are we with our brothers and sisters of the Christian faith around the world? Where is it? that our identity can be found. What is it that unites us? Is there any unity? Can it be found that we are united in one way or another? I want to read for you our text for today to try to begin to answer that question. This continues our series that we're looking at some passages uh, from 1 John here. This is 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 to 21. I know it's on the screen, but I really encourage you to open up your Bibles and keep them open there. You might want to look back and forth as we go through the message today. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 21. John writes, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. 
Whoever does not love does not know God, because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his Son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is made complete in us. We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in him and he in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in him. In this way, love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment because in this world, we are like him. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and yet hates his brother, he is a liar. For anyone who does not love his brother, whom he has seen, cannot love God, whom he has not seen. And he has given us this command, whoever loves God must also love his brother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now, if you think about this text... If you think about what this text is saying, it does not outright say, here is your identity, ding, 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 ding. This is what it's all about. This is how you shall be known. In fact, the way that it twists and turns, it's hard to catch what this text is saying if you're just reading through this for the very first time, except we see it has a lot to do with love, doesn't it? <laughs> At least it keeps on using that word. 26 times in those 14 verses, 26 times it uses the word love. And this word love here is the agape love. The love like God loves. The love of God. The love from God. The way that God loves us. The way that God loves the world. So this is really serious stuff. Splattering agape love all over this text. What do we have? To start with, to start off, we're, is it encouraged or commanded, love one another? That's the first thing. Bang! Right off the bat. Love one another! Just imagine reading this, you've had a bad day at work. <laughs> love one another! Just imagine this, that you're reading this, and it was a rough night at home. Parents and kids, you, you all probably have perfect, normal, walk, rock, well lives, I'm sure, but just imagine a friend or a neighbor of yours, you had a rough night at home. Love one another. We start off, love one another. And here's the thing. The reason why John says it, it's really presumption. The reason we're love, we know God. Oh, wait, just real quick test here. How many of you know God? That's most of the hands. Okay, we don't have too much remedial work to do. That, that, that's all that really is necessary. You know God? Yep, yeah, okay. Love one another. That's really what, it's, what, what John is, is, his argument is. We know God, so we should love one another. John figures it like this. Love's from God, and if you love, you're born of God, and you know God. If you don't love, you don't know God because God is love. So you see, what I'm talking about here, John doesn't really ask even a rhetorical question. Do you love God? Do you know him? He just assumes, he's writing to this group of people, and he just assumes, he just takes for granted that they know God. He's not even asking the simple question, is God in you? Should we get on the same page to start with, is God in you? Okay, then you should love one another. No. He assumes, he takes for granted, you've got God in you, you know God, so here's where we start. You need to love each other. Now here, let's understand, let's understand, he is talking to the believers. He is talking here, he is writing to the church as it was in this place when he first wrote this letter. 
when he says that you need to love one another. So, in the spirit of John, I want to ask you, I put to you, church, do you love each other? Do you love each other? If John was writing this letter and the pastor was reading this letter to you from John, love one another, do you, members of Rules Church, do you, the brothers and sisters of this church family, love one another? Can you look at each person, each person, not squinting or, you know, like doing one of these, can you look at each person and honestly say, I love him or her? I want you to take a moment. Look around. Stand up if you have to so you can see. Because we don't want to leave anyone else. If you leave anyone else, it's a problem. Take a look around, honestly, seriously. I won't ask you, I won't make you write down a list or something here and turn it in, but think about it. Can you look around at each person and honestly say, I love him. I love her. And then could you or would you say it out loud? Because, getting ahead of myself here a little bit, <clears throat> verse 18 says that perfect love drives out fear. There's no fear in love. Can you look at one another and think, I love Andy, but can you say out loud, I love Andy, he's my brother in Christ. I love Susie, she's my sister in Christ. Can you say it out loud and mean it? Here's a question for us to dwell on, really. Seriously, to dwell on. Do we love each other? And if you say yes, remember, we've already talked about love a little bit. A couple weeks in a row, we've been talking about love from some different angles. And we've already talked about the idea that we are supposed to love in word and deed. It's not just enough to say, I love Patrick. I need to show Patrick I love him. I need to live my life in such a way that it demonstrates the love that I have for him if I will say that I do. And here's the thing, though. Probably, if we're honest, if we're honest, probably everyone has someone they struggle to love, right? I'm not going to ask you to name any names. Please don't wink at anybody or nothing. <laughs> Everybody is someone they struggle to love, right? The problem is, that's normal. The problem is that too many people don't struggle at all with this. What I mean is, there's someone they don't love. They know they don't love them, and they don't try. They're thinking, oh, I really don't like that brother there. They're, they're, they're fine. Or a sister over there, she's a little, mm, no. And they don't try. They don't care. They don't care that they don't love. And when they don't care, when they don't try, when people don't care, and when people don't try to love the people around them, when you don't care, and you don't try to love the people around you who are part of your family, not only is it failing to follow Jesus, I would submit to you that it is obvious to others. And this is where the identity crisis really kicks in, or, or it goes to a whole new level. We have an identity crisis in the world today. There's, there's two different aspects to this. It's one thing if we struggle in the church with who we are. You know, if you think about God and yourself, wow. Casting Crowns has an amazing song. Some of you might recognize, Who Am I? Listen to the lyrics of these verses here. Who am I that the Lord of all the earth would care to know my name, would care to feel my hurt? Who am I that the bright and morning star would choose to light the way for my ever-wandering heart? Who am I that the eyes that see my sin would look on me with love and watch me rise again? Who am I that the voice that calmed the sea would call out through the rain and calm the storm in me? If we spend time considering ourselves and God, if we spend time thinking about our sinfulness and God's righteousness, our smallness and His incredible holiness, anyone can have a bit of an identity crisis. Okay? But it's something altogether different. 
when the people who see us, who are looking at us from the outside, question, who are you? I thought you were a Christian. That's something completely different. That's a whole different kind of identity crisis going on right there. Now, there are plenty of people who might struggle to figure out who you are because they just have no idea. There's no basis for them to understand. I'm writing this sermon, I'm thinking about this, and I thought about the movie The Princess Bride. How many of you watched The Princess Bride? You have early on here the scene with Inigo Montoya. He's this hired swordsman who has studied swordplay for 20, 25 years. Uh, as he is trying to find the person who killed his father and he wants to get revenge. He's hired on for a mission. We see this, this sword fight between him and this masked guy, this unknown guy. Now, Inegu thinks he is like the hottest thing since sliced bread. He is the end-all, be-all of sword play. Who could possibly defeat him? He hasn't been defeated in umpteen zillion years. Except here comes this complete unknown who is making a, a, a mockery of him. He did not even realize it at first, but then he realizes how much better this guy is than him. He looks at him and says, who are you? And the lion is Oh, no other consequence. <laughs> it's completely understandable. You know, people have absolutely no basis to understand who you are, to recognize you for who you are. It's understandable if, if there's not recognition at first. But you're all familiar. You are all familiar with times when you look at someone that you thought you knew and, and you are surprised in some way when the identity seems to be in question. Sometimes it's a humorous thing. Sometimes it's an amusing thing. Parents, how many of you have a sloppy child? A messy child? <laughs> Maybe you shouldn't raise your hands here. Confession time will be at the altar later on. Kids, how many of you are that sloppy child? <laughs> how many of you can relate that you have this one child who just for the life of them cannot keep things straight, clean, organized, orderly, or whatever, and then one day out of the blue, completely unbidden, you did not say a word, you did not hint, and you walk in and there's the room just perfectly pristine. Everything so immaculate and where it's supposed to be and orderly, and you're thinking, what happened to my child? Did space aliens come and abduct them, or is this some kind of clone? Sometimes this issue of recognition, we think one thing, we experience another. Sometimes we can be a little grateful for it. If you have that forgetful husband, a forgetful husband who out of the blue, boy, this birthday, they, they nailed this birthday. They got it from beginning to end. There's flowers in the morning, and there's chocolates at lunch, and then there's out for dinner, and there's, there's, there's entertainment. The kids are taken care of. There's a thoughtful present, a present that's really for them, something they'll appreciate, not like a socket set that you can use here when I, you know, so you don't use mine. You know, wife is thinking, wow. <laughs> I can get used to this, but is this really my husband? Is this going to stick? Sometimes, sometimes the, the issue of recognition, of identity, uh, there's kind of a wonder factor here. You, you, you see maybe the mediocre student or the mediocre athlete who just nails a test. They got 100%, and, and the brainiacs in the class only got 73. What happened? Is this stupid? Is that for real? Or, or, or the, the, the third string quarterback who comes in and throws the sparkling touchdown to win the game? Like, who is that player and why wasn't he drafted number one? It's, you're all familiar with these kind of moments. You're all familiar with these kind of moments when, when identity seems to be in question, where we think we know something uh, but about someone, but we don't recognize them for something that they do or something they didn't do. But, and, and, and those can be good, those can be fun, those can be uplifting, those can be powerful, but it is not good at all, anytime, in any way, when someone looks on the one that they know or they believe to be a Christian, they believe to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and they see them doing something that they know, and, and maybe even they're not a Christian themselves, but I know this much, if you're a Christian, you're not supposed to do this. They see this Christian or supposed Christian doing something they shouldn't be doing, and they say, well, this guy is a Christian. He says, he, what's he doing? Who is he? Is he for real? Is this what Christianity is about? Is this what it means to follow Jesus? There is no scenario where that is ever a good thing. If someone, especially an unbeliever, would wonder, a 
about you and who you are as a follower because of the way that you live. Yesterday, Friday, yesterday there was a news article in the Lancaster papers about a DJ from WJTL, our Christian radio station, who had to be listened to. One of the DJs was arrested, charged, not convicted yet, but charged with multiple counts of sexually related crimes. How do you think that, that in the news would affect non-believing readers of that article? How do you think that that will play for people who are on the fence? Think of the questions and the scorn that that brings, not just to that person, but to the ministry and in a larger sense to our faith as believers in Jesus Christ. Here's the thing, any time, any time our standard, any time our standard toward one another in the church falls from love for one another, just loving one another, that's our goal, that's our standard. Any time it falls from that standard of loving one another to anything else, anything else, we are in danger of causing someone to question. We are in danger of raising doubt. We are in danger even of pushing someone away. We cause an identity crisis because we are not fulfilling our basic purpose or mission as followers of Jesus Christ. In the past few weeks, we've been talking about love. We've been talking about love from some different angles and different perspectives. And our, our, our text today... Our text today supports an idea that we've heard there that love is, 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 isn't love unless it's acted out. And our text today supports that. But I would suggest to you that our text today says something more. That it conveys something even deeper. If God is love and we are to love, if we are to abide in love, as verse 16 tells us we are, love is something more than what we do. Love is who we are. Love is our identity. We all have a certain identity, pastor, husband, father, blame. But love is the number one identity that I should be wearing and that people should know me by that crosses all these other identities and boundaries. Love is the thing that people should see when they see us. Love is what they should get. Really, when people get confused by our actions, that there's that identity crisis in someone's mind about who I am because what they see, that there's that identity crisis going on is because their expectations of me as a Christian, as a follower of Jesus Christ, they don't seem to be evident in action. Whenever that question, whenever that doubt arises in anyone's mind, the issue is love because what is missing, what they are not seeing, what they are not feeling, what they are not experiencing is love. Whether that love is missing for a moment in time or whether it has been missing for a period of time. Whether that love seems to be missing in general, or whether that love seems to be missing in some very specific way. When questions arise about who we are, when questions arise about who we are as Christians, on a personal level, or all together, the question they're really asking is, where is love? That's what's missing. When people look at us, as believers, love is what they should see. Love is what they should experience. Love is what they should receive. And even if they can't say it, they don't have the words for it, they don't have the same background for it, they should feel it. They feel something special. They feel something different. They feel something powerful with us. If you want to look at it from the flip side, from the negative side, another way to think about it, and, and it's worth thinking about because there are so many people who live their lives completely isolated and distracted or numb in their bearing. And, and these people might not be paying attention to you. You know, they might not really be paying attention because they're so self-centered, self-interested, or even in negative ways. They might not see the love, they might not feel the love, but no matter what, even the person who's living their life in the most negative way should feel something different. 
with us. So they shouldn't feel the lack of love. We should feel different from them. They would not be able to say it's love and see, oh yes, this person's loving. But we should feel so very different to them that they're drawn to that. Or that we should feel so very different from them because of what they lack and what we have that they can't help but notice. We should never come across to anyone as cold or distant, distracted or uncaring. That's not our way if we are in God and God is in us. Love should be a part of everything we do and are. As Jesus was, as Jesus was so long ago, for all who could see. So we should be today, you and I, brothers and sisters, are the face of love. God's love to the world.